Chapter 305, Bloodfang. Wow, they have a coliseum down here? Daphne stared in awe at the magnificent structure. I'm sure they have much more hidden in these tunnels. I really need to write an article about this. Zeno was taking mental notes. I'm not sure that would be a good idea, my friend, Dumbledore added. What you see here, spoke the general, is just a small arena meant for trials. We have a much bigger one for the tournaments. I didn't expect to have an audience, Dumbledore glanced at the goblins sitting around the stone platform. There were at least two dozen of them, watching attentively from the stone benches that surrounded the arena. The commander gave the goblins a glare of disapproval. This matter should not have reached the ears of the public, but word gets around quickly. I'm sure many are here to see what kind of human dares to challenge a goblin to a martial battle. They moved to one side of the arena. Once inside, it was not too different from the one at the Ministry of Magic. It was a rectangular stone platform that had been raised a few feet off the ground with one entrance on each side. All around it were places for the audience to watch, as well as some extra-large doors covered with metallic fences situated below them. The decorations were undoubtedly superior, and the intricate carvings on the stones were a clear showcase of goblin artisanal skills. On the other side of the fighting arena, they spotted the judge, Bluefang. Next to him was a large goblin, fully clad in dark metal armor with a helmet that completely hid his face. I assume that is my opponent? Harry asked. Commander Silverax nodded. Indeed, that is Bloodfang, he said with a solemn tone. You seemed very upset when the judge mentioned that name before. Why is that? Daphne decided to ask. Of course I was. You wouldn't know about him, but Captain Bloodfang is one of our best warriors. He has also been the Coliseum champion for the past five years in a row. There aren't many who would dare to cross blades with him. He is known for his cruelty and incredible thirst for blood. Judge Bluefang has been excessive in his choice of a champion for this trial, to fight a human child, he glanced at Harry. No offense, he added. We'll see about that. Harry returned the stare. Bloodfang stepped into the arena platform, and they could now see him much better. He was certainly much bigger than the average goblin, almost reaching the height of a human. His body was also incredibly thick. His bulging muscles could be seen in between the gaps of his armor, he looked very impressive and intimidating as he turned to glare at his opponent. Bloodfang pulled out his sword and pointed it at Harry. The human who wants to die, step up here. I don't have all day. His sword was very crude looking. It had a single-edged thick blade shaped more like a cleaver than a sword. On his left arm, he held a circular metallic shield with intricate carvings on it. All of his equipment seemed to have been crafted with goblin steel, and all of it was heavily enchanted, as the glowing runes indicated. How scary, Harry said. And am I supposed to face my opponent while still chained and unarmed? Does your champion require a handicap, perhaps? What did you say? Bloodfang shouted. The commander gave a sign to one of his men, and this one removed Harry's restraints. Over there, Silver Axe pointed to one side of the arena. You will find weapons and armor. Take what you need. He didn't believe this was going to be a long fight, but to send him in unarmed would be a stain on his honor. Then, Harry gave Dumbledore, Daphne, and Zeno a quick look before turning around. I'll be back in a moment. This earned him a few grunts and huffs from the upset goblins who were watching the human group. We'll be here, said Zeno. Don't take things too far, Daphne added. Most of the goblins in the arena thought that this wizard had lost his sanity for even requesting a trial by combat, and even more so after the fact that he did know to try to run away from the challenge after learning who his opponent was. Harry ignored the stairs and walked to the shelves containing the armament. He never had any intention of wearing any goblin armor, even if there was something there that could fit him. His eyes moved to the weapons. There was a good variety of them, short swords, long swords, hammers, axes, spears. But even he could easily tell that these were just normal weapons, made with regular steel and without a single rune carved into them. One could find weapons such as these in any muggle shop that sold medieval-style blades. There was nothing special about them. The armors were much the same. Compared to that, the equipment worn by Bloodfang could be considered priceless magical artifacts. Harry shrugged, 
and picked up a long sword. These kinds of things did not have much importance to him. It also didn't really matter what weapon he chose, as none of them would be able to pierce that goblin steel-enchanted armor. With his sword in hand, he jumped on top of the rectangular platform, ready to face his opponent. Bloodfang laughed when he saw him like this. Oh, this is going to be quick. Harry's eyes became sharp for a moment. Yes, I think so too. Chapter 306, Cutting Through the Competition Right after the judge gave the signal to start, Bloodfang jumped into action without hesitation. He felt no threat from Harry or the simple steel sword in his hand. In only a short moment, he had closed the gap between them. Gah! His cleaver descended upon Harry at tremendous speed, aiming at his shoulder. Harry used his own blade to deflect Bloodfang's. As the two weapons made contact, the blade of Harry's sword was cut at an angle with no effort, leaving only a small piece of it. Bloodfang laughed and lifted his sword again. I'm finishing this now, boy. As he did this, Harry moved his eyes to the gap in the armor covering his right arm. There were a few inches of space around the joint of his elbow. Moving at lightning speed, he drove his broken sword in there, stabbing the goblin's exposed flesh. Bloodfang screamed in agony but did not stop his attack. Harry used his other hand to stop the vertical slash by grasping onto the goblin's gauntlet. Bloodfang gasped in shock when he saw this. By all means, he should be heavier and stronger than this human boy. This made no sense to him. He felt like he was having a terrible nightmare. This can't be. Harry moved his fingers to get a good hold on his opponent's blade before lifting his left leg and sending a powerful kick. Bloodfang raised his shield and blocked it, but the impact was enough to make him release his weapon before being sent flying backward. He only managed to stop himself at the border of the arena, and he hurried to stand back up and stare at Harry, who was now holding his own weapon in a menacing manner. This has to be a dream, Bloodfang said. Humans were not supposed to be like this. The goblins watching were also thinking the same. They could not believe what they were seeing. Bloodfang grunted in pain as he removed the broken sword from his elbow. Arg! His eyes became bloodshot. You damn human! I will kill you for this. His hatred rose to the point of losing his self-control. He was about to run at Harry, but quickly realized there was no need for that, as this one was already doing that by himself. Fast, Bloodfang muttered. He could barely follow Harry's movements as he approached. Before he could formulate any sort of plan, Harry was already next to him. Letting his instincts take over, Bloodfang raised his shield to block the attack. He knew how dangerous that blade was, but his shield was made of the same material, so it stood to reason that it should be able to resist its assault. Even with his quick reaction, Bloodfang was barely able to lift his shield in time to intercept the horizontal swing from Harry. He heard a loud clanking noise as the metals collided, followed by a sharp pain in his left arm. When he looked down, he understood why. His shield had been cut in half, and so had his arm. The goblin had never suffered any serious wounds during his entire career as a fighter and a soldier. Ah! No! He screamed at the top of his lungs. His will to fight had been instantly shattered. Bloodfang's eyes moved to the front, trying to find Harry, but the human had already vanished from sight. He then heard Bluefang shouting, Stop! It's already off! Bloodfang felt something hitting the back of his head, and then nothing. Harry released the grip on the blade and let it fall, along with Bloodfang, who had the blade stuck on top of his head. He didn't want to drag the fight more than necessary, so after disarming his opponent, Harry moved behind him and gave the goblin a lethal blow. The audience was not happy with him. Impossible. That boy killed Bloodfang? He... he must be using magic. Yeah, he must have done something strange. The audience was both angry and unconvinced about his performance. Silence! The commander shouted with authority. You shan't say a single word about what happened here today. The commander's eyes locked onto Harry. The wizard fought according to our rules. So, I'm free to go then? Harry glanced at the E Judge. Blue Fang appeared to be extremely enraged and did not take his eyes off Harry. Hmm, and I don't have to pay anything, right? Harry decided to add. The judge glared at Harry for a good minute. Then, I can't believe he shouted at me like that. Just because I won the fight, what a sore loser. 
Harry huffed as they walked out of Gringotts. I'm fairly sure that Bloodfang and the judge were related, Daphne commented. Well, what was I supposed to do? It was a fight to the death, Harry said defensively. He did what he had to do. I'm not sure that was the case, Dumbledore joined in the conversation. That goblin judge never mentioned that you must continue to fight until someone dies. Now that you mention it, it was true that the goblin only said there was a risk of death. I believe he was about to stop the fight before you. Daphne made a motion with her hand. But look at the bright side. The goblins would have been a lot angrier if they found out that you cheated. Dumbledore gave Harry a knowing look. Cheated? Cheated? Zenos asked. What do you mean? Harry fought with a sword like they wanted. Daphne did not understand it either. He did fight with a sword, but as for not doing any magic, Dumbledore started. You used magic? Daphne had not noticed this at all. They only said that I couldn't use my wand. They never said anything about wandless magic, Harry stated. It was implied, and you know it. Dumbledore gave him a look of disapproval. He knew that Harry could have won without breaking any rule, but decided to do it anyway. What did you do? Daphne was just curious at this point. I used a bit of wandless magic to make the sword cut a bit better. Also, I used some enhancement charms on my legs, Harry admitted. You are lucky the goblins have a poor understanding of wandless magic, so they could not pick on that. But they definitely know you did something. But otherwise, that goblin steel sword should not have been able to cut through the shield in such a way, Dumbledore explained. I wanted to finish it faster, okay? Let's keep this among ourselves. The goblins are angry enough with me. Angry? They were talking about banning you from Gringa's we were leaving. Daphne said. What's done is done. Harry shrugged. And it was much better than my alternative plan anyway. You had another idea? What was it? Daphne asked. Ah, well. Harry scratched his head. I think I better not say. That could have ended up in a war. Ahem. Dumbledore cleared his throat. He wanted to change the topic of the conversation, but there was still something he wanted to know. What were you even doing down there? What was so valuable inside that vault that you would even risk starting a war to take it? That's... Harry looked around. It was late afternoon, but there were still a lot of people in Diagon Alley. I'll tell you another day, Dumbledore nodded. He could agree that this was hardly a good place to speak about important matters. Very well. You may tell me tomorrow when you come to my office, then. Tomorrow? Harry appeared to be confused. Have you forgotten? Dumbledore asked. The Quidditch finals are tomorrow. You asked me to get us some seats. Chapter 307. Visiting the Headmaster. The next day, during the early hours of the morning, Harry visited the Headmaster's office. He apparated in the hallway and walked to the gargoyle. Harry was waiting for it to request the password and speak some nonsense in return, but to his surprise, the statue moved aside without saying a word and allowed him to pass. When he entered the office, he found the old headmaster in his usual seat, writing something on a parchment. Your gargoyle is broken, Harry told him. No, it is not, Dumbledore answered without lifting his eyes from the parchment. It didn't ask me for a password this time. Dumbledore stopped writing and placed the quill back on its stand. I have given you full access to my office so the gargoyle has no need for a password. Hmm, you ruined my fun. Harry then heard a loud cry coming from the other side of the office. Hello to you too, Fox. The phoenix made some cheerful noises in response. Wait, so this means I'm a fully-fledged headmaster now? Harry asked. Dumbledore chuckled. As far as Hogwarts is concerned, yes, but legally, you are still a normal student. Why? Are you interested in the position? Not at all. Sitting all day in that chair, writing and reading stuff. That's really not my style, Harry said in a joking manner, though he knew the real reason behind the headmaster's actions. He was making preparations for the worst-case scenario. With that out of the way, can you tell me now? What were you doing at Gringotts yesterday? Dumbledore was very curious about what could be so important as to risk turning the goblin nation into enemies. The fourth deathly hallow, Harry answered. There is no such thing, Dumbledore muttered, not entirely sure if Harry was just trying to test him in some way. Hey, you don't know everything, that's fine. Until yesterday, he had no idea either. And you found this unheard of relic in Gringotts? 
The headmaster did not look very convinced yet. Inside the Peverell vault, Harry said. Indeed? Dumbledore raised an eyebrow. I would love to see it. I thought you would. Harry distanced himself from the large table and moved to a less crowded place in the office. He closed his eyes for a moment and focused. What? Dumbledore stood up from his chair and stared in shock at Harry. A black substance seemed to emerge from inside his body and covered him completely. What is that? Dumbledore asked. The fabric of the robes was fluttering around, despite there being no wind inside the office. It covered Harry's body from head to toe, and Dumbledore could barely see him at all, except for a pair of green eyes, which made the whole look more unsettling. Harry? Dumbledore called for him with a hint of wariness. As he had done with Daphne, Harry removed the hood and revealed his face. This time it was easier, and he was much more aware of what he was doing. He had time for a few hours of practice last night at home. That's not what I was expecting. Dumbledore continued to observe the robes with great interest. He wasn't as knowledgeable as Xenophilius when it came to the Deathly Hallows, but he had seen enough depictions of death to recognize how much these robes resembled them. The robes of death. That's what Zeno said. What do you think? Still doubtful? Harry asked. And you found them inside the Peverell vault? How did you... Right. Dumbledore was about to ask how Harry managed to open a vault belonging to another house, but now the charges from the goblins made more sense to him. The headmaster sat back down in his chair. Now that I have it in front of me, I do not doubt the artifact's authenticity, but your method of acquiring it could have been a bit more discreet. Yes, well, things didn't go according to plan, Dumbledore smiled. They usually don't, my boy. So what does this fourth hallow do? The other three all offer powerful abilities. I cannot imagine this one to be any less. Haven't had much time to test it, but I think I've learned about the nature of this artifact and the abilities it offers. It is a bit more complicated than the other three, Harry explained. Is that so? Care to elaborate? The headmaster asked with interest. Harry pointed to a ceramic cup resting on top of the headmaster's table. It was the one he used for his morning tea. The elves hadn't removed it yet. I'll do a small demonstration. Keep your eyes on the cup, Harry said as he focused. All of a sudden, a pitch black circle appeared next to the cup. The circle was just floating in the air, and it was so dark that it almost seemed as if someone had removed a piece of space itself, leaving behind an empty void. Dumbledore was already surprised by this, but then a hand appeared from inside the black void and took hold of the cup, dragging it inside before disappearing. Dumbledore's eyes moved to Harry, just in time to see him pulling his hand out of a similar black hole. Harry was holding on to his cup. Pretty nifty, huh? Harry said with a grin before moving closer to the desk and placing the cup back in its original place. The black circles vanished from existence, and everything returned to how it was before. Space manipulation, Dumbledore muttered. Chapter 308, Changes in the Ministry and the Teaching Staff. A very rare type of magic, Dumbledore added. What else can you do with it? The robes began to shrink until they disappeared completely. Come on, I didn't come here to perform tricks for you, Professor. The truth was that he couldn't really do anything more at the moment. But this was the result of just one night of practice, so it wasn't too shabby. The headmaster returned to his usual calm demeanor. Right, but we still have some time before the port key becomes active. He pulled a piece of paper from one of the drawers. There is something I want you to see first. A teacher's list? Harry read the headline out loud. Yes, they are the selected teachers for this upcoming school year. I think you'll find some of the names interesting, Dumbledore told him. Harry's face went pale when he saw the name. Wait, Dolores Umbridge? As the defense teacher? Please, tell me this is a joke list or something. No, I'm afraid that is the final list. It has already been approved by the school board, Dumbledore said with a solemn tone. You are aware of what type of person she is, because I told you about it, Harry stated. Even if you didn't, I would still know very well what kind of person she is. So I take it you didn't personally choose her for the position. What happened then? Harry asked. That choice was forced upon me by a new law that allows the Ministry of Magic to influence some decisions for all magical schools located within Britain. 
the school board also put as much pressure as possible to get the choices they wanted. You are the chief warlock of the Wizengamot. How can that happen? Dumbledore's expression became more somber. I no longer hold that position. It was decided by a majority vote to remove me from it and choose someone else instead. What? Harry expected some things to change, but this was moving very quickly. I believe, Electo Caro has now been given that honor. My influence in the ministry is very minimal at the moment. I have no doubt that I will also lose my title of Supreme Mugwump of the ICW very soon, as my contacts there have been warning me. It is already fortunate that I managed to hold on to my place as headmaster. They will no doubt try to take that away as soon as possible. I wasn't aware that things were that dire already. Looks like you took a political beating this summer. Many things have happened, yes, the minister has changed the most. He is now much more aggressive and imposing with his moves. His policies are also much more extreme and openly anti-muggle. I guess I underestimated what Lord Parkinson was capable of. You don't really think this is just him making these decisions, Harry stated. No, of course not. These things happening shortly after Voldemort's return cannot be a coincidence. He must be the one behind many of the changes. No one has seen it yet, but I can feel his influence in the ministry. Harry glanced back at the list. So we are going to have that woman as a teacher. You have no idea how insufferable she is going to be. He was beginning to contemplate the pros and cons of killing her in the first week of school. Indeed, they even forced me to retire, Professor Binns. The ghost. You know, that is not a terrible idea anyway. Who is the replacement? He went down the list until he found the name of the new history professor. This can't be right. I know what you are going to say. That man is a known follower of the Dark Lord, but he was cleared of all charges after leaving Azkaban. No, this man is more than a Death Eater. He is a dead Death Eater. Harry looked at the name again, in case he made a mistake. What are you? I'm saying that Augustus Rookwood is dead. He cannot conceivably be a teacher, unless you are planning on replacing one ghost with another. Dead? No, that's not possible. I have personally seen him speak before the school board last week. Dumbledore said with absolute certainty. Harry informed him about the night he went into his castle. But you never found his body. He could have escaped from whoever attacked his house. I summoned his soul, Harry revealed. Dumbledore's expression changed. You did? Harry had already told him about his ability to control the Deathly Hallows' powers, so he was not too surprised to hear this. Dumbledore was even a first-hand witness to these abilities when Harry tried to bring the soul of his sister Ariana back. It only lasted for a few minutes, and but he would never forget it for as long as he lived. According to what Harry said, he could only maintain the connection for a short period of time because she had been dead for too long, and her spirit was now too disconnected from the mortal realm, making the process more difficult and consuming. So, what did his spirit have to say? Dumbledore asked with curiosity. Nothing. I could not talk to him at all. His soul had been damaged beyond repair and disappeared shortly after, Harry explained. Are you suggesting what I think you are? Dumbledore asked. A person dies, their soul is either damaged or destroyed, and then that same person is walking around like nothing had happened. Harry looked at Dumbledore directly. Can you think of any magic that can accomplish that feat?